for joining us today. Yes, it is being recorded. Um, hi, my name is Gwen Corner. I work at Northeastern as the program manager for the Idea Venture Accelerator on campus. And so it's a student-led organization helping new businesses get their start. Um, but today I'm here in a capacity to talk about social entrepreneurship and the social side of business. And I'll be moderating the panel this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves in a moment, but just by means of quick introduction about me, I've already mentioned my role at the university, but I do also have a background in social entrepreneurship. I've worked in nonprofit work, um, as well as renewable operations, and um, got my MBA in social entrepreneurship and sustainability as well. So definitely have a, have a special place in my heart for the discussion we're having today, as well as the topics we'll cover. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our panelists. And, and when introducing yourselves, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of share a little bit of detail about your experience, of course, but also what inspired you to enter into the social impact space. So I'll kick it off with Ben shortly. Great, thanks, Gwen. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Ben Kneppers. Um, I am currently uh, co-founder and CEO of a, a company called Boreo. Um, we're focused on creating um, positive solutions to this growing issue we're facing of ocean plastic pollution. Uh, we've been operating for over seven years, um, uh, really between California and South America, uh, where we work together <coughs> directly with fisheries to create an end of life solution to a material that's now been identified as the most harmful form of ocean plastic pollution being discarded fishing nets. Um, <clears throat> through our program, Net Positiva, we partner directly with those fisheries to transform those nets into a uh, high value raw material source that we can then transform into new positive products. Uh, we started by our own line of skateboards that uh, was run, supported by the IDEA program, uh, and now has expanded into a branded material known as Net Plus um, that we have with over seven partnering brands, our biggest being with Patagonia, who's also our um, impact investor. Uh, where we're now working very closely with them to incorporate into their product line. Uh, background on me, uh, I grew up uh, just outside of Cape Cod. Uh, I did my mechanical engineering degree at Northeastern, graduated in 2007, um, where uh, I really took advantage of the co-op program. I did my co-ops uh, in uh, San Diego, California, Galway, Ireland, um, Zambia, uh, Mahaba Refugee Settlement in Zambia, and finished my uh, capstone project with a NASA Ames research project. Um, and out of all those things, the biggest takeaway I had was actually my experience, uh, as you can imagine, working in the refugee settlement where I got a taste of something known as reverse culture shock. Uh, I wanted to understand why these unjustifiable, unjustifiable situations were happening in the world. And <clears throat> I got turned to the field of sustainability. Uh, I got introduced to someone that recently completed a master's in a sustainability program in Sweden. And as soon as I finished uh, my engineering degree, I got accepted to take one summer off and jump straight into that. And, uh, and, and basically that kind of slung shot me into the field of sustainability where I worked five plus years and then jumped into working at Beret. So I'll stop my storyline there. There's plenty to dig into and we can do that later on. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Happy to have you here. All right, um, next up is Katie Burkhardt. Hi everybody. Um, so I am the founder and CEO of both Matter7 and Illumin. Um, I started my career uh, by founding Matter7, which is a branding firm um, that works specifically with purpose-driven organizations. Um, I actually, you know, how did I get into this? I actually started the firm to work exclusively with nonprofits who I felt like were doing in a lot of cases really good work but getting you know really shoddy support um, as far as being treated as a serious brand um, and if they were really going to get out there um, and make the impact they wanted they they really needed to have the right things and especially the right strategy um, having done that for a number of years what I found was that um, while it was great for their brand they weren't really able to translate that same strategy into how they were running their business, which was always the intent. Um, and that's what caused me to launch Illumin, which is a service um, technology, service and technology company that's really looking at it from the business side of things um, and how can you really um, measure your impact um, and put in you know, strategic goals, benchmarks, metrics to really determine how you're doing on both purpose and profit. Um, and that's something I'm excited to be 
growing. Um, I'm, in, I'm in startup mode myself. Um, looking at the bigger picture, uh, I'm someone that's been fortunate to love my work. Um, I always have, um, and I'm really driven to make work matter for other people. Um, literally one of my goals is to eliminate the phrase, it's just a job. Um, we spend like a third of our lives at work. I think that that's you know, not giving it enough credit for the amount of time it takes up. Um, and that's why matter to me is you know, equal parts strategic and positively impactful. Um, I really wanna see people using their time effectively um, and putting their time towards something that you know, is meaningful to them. Thank you, Katie, appreciate that. And also just quick shout out to Katie. She has uh, written lots of different articles, but has also um, helped us kind of drive the conversation with some definitions that we won't actually cover in the discussion today, but we might be using some of this terminology. So please check out the chat and the link in the chat um, now and you know after the conversation as well to get some of those definitions for yourself. Um, all right, last up, Tita, please introduce yourself. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Um, unlike my uh, partners, I am a, I'm a retired, you know, uh, you know, professor, and um, and one of those endangered species. I'm hunkered down in my basement, cannot get out because my town has been uh, declared deep red, even though we are in Massachusetts and we can't even go out. So I am taking care of myself and, you know, trying to survive. My story, you know, can be a, a, a long story, but I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, I am from Cameroon uh, and I came over to the United States and uh, in the sixties and uh, went to school at Duke and did engineering and then uh, worked with IBM and then uh, went to Pitt, eventually to USC and ended up starting uh, my teaching, you know, career at Northeastern uh, in 78 or 79. So I've been associated with Northeastern for about 40 years. And um, during this period, I have had many encounters in what I used to think was uh, entrepreneurship. First of all, when I did uh, finish with my graduate work and I came to Northeastern in 79, the first thing I did was to get my bags together and go back to Cameroon uh, to introduce the computer. And uh, there's a lot of stories behind that. I thought I was going to actually bring innovation to Cameroon. And, uh, and I thought of myself as a social entrepreneur because I was doing it to help you know, my country not to, not to be rich, but, uh, and I considered that to be social entrepreneurship at the time. I did that, I thought I was gonna do it for two years, but I did it for 13 years. And then when I left from there, I went to the United Nations and I worked in the United Nations under the United Nations Development Program. And uh, my task there was to work with what they call the G77 group which is supposed to promote South-South cooperation. And just to put it in context, uh, we were focused on trying to uh, develop relationships between uh, Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And you can think about the, 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 the global marketplace as a place where you know, people trade and, uh, but when you look at the South-South trade, that's trade between Latin America and Africa, between Africa and Asia, it amounts to some 0.004% of world trade. And uh, this particular unit of mine and the United Nations was committed to doing something about it. And that was considered, you know, social entrepreneurship. Well, we got a little bit of a problem when uh, the uh, units in uh, Bangladesh uh, uh, started, you know, the, uh, the, the Grameen Bank, and most of you know about Eunice and uh, his poverty uh, alleviating program in Bangladesh. And we got into a big conflict uh, at the United Nations in terms of whether or not you help the third world develop by lifting themselves with their bootstrap, you know, with $50 loan, or you help them have access to the world market 
by uh, working with the WTO and so on. So there was a conflict there. And uh, that's when I left, came back to Northeastern after I found myself at the bottom of the World Trade Center during the 9-11 uh, thing. I survived, so I came back to Northeastern to live my, my second life. And uh, that's when we got this social entrepreneurship program started, you know, at Northeastern. So it has been a journey of, you know, uh, doing things at uh, institutional levels, uh, the global level, and then of course, uh, uh, some, uh, some social entre entrepreneurship uh, uh, exercises, uh, helping and working with students that started some very exciting projects all over the world. So my, my take on this is almost eclectic. I, you know, I have been through that journey at the local level, the institutional level, the global level. And uh, at my age now, I'm just, you know, willing to share what I thought I learned in different areas and would be glad, you know, to address, you know, those issues, you know, with, with you and uh, I'm happy to be here, you know, to, uh, to share those things. So thank you, Gwen. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and as all of you can see, we have quite a breadth of experience on our panel today and kind of across lots of different industries and with lots of different experiences. So how we're gonna kind of frame today is talking a little bit high level in the first half of the discussion and then the second half of the discussion to be a little bit more action, action oriented for those of you actually trying to implement some of these tools in businesses of your own or in entrepreneurship in the corporate world. Um, so, and again, I'll just highlight once more that there is a link in the chat that Katie has uh, lovingly give a, given us to help guide the conversation with some definition. So I appreciate that again, Katie. Um, but it's a great starting off point for our conversation today. Uh, you consult with multiple companies across purpose, about purpose-driven work and sustainability. So I'm wondering in your experience, if you could share a little bit about what it means to, for business to be socially and environmentally sustainable. Absolutely. So I think at a fundamental level, it means that the business or organization is focused on their long-term impact rather than prioritizing short-term goals. Um, and that's something that, you know, seems really simple to say, um, but for a lot of groups, it's a huge mental shift um, to be thinking about, you know, not this quarter's earnings or what we did in this particular program today, but to really be looking at um, you know, a longer term view. And we've started to see that shift happening, I think, in a larger way, which is exciting. Um, if you take it a step further, um, many people will look at sustainability and stop at the environment, whether that's green movements or in some cases, greenwashing, which is not so great. Um, that's, you know, there's that connotation around sustainability. In reality, sustainability is composed of three pill pillars, um, economic, environmental, and social. Um, which is known informally as profits, planet, and people, or the triple bottom line, because we needed six ways to refer to the same thing. Um, if you start there um, as a business, um, you know, you should be looking at your long-term impact on all three areas from sustainable financial growth. You know, what's your business plan that's going to make sure you can grow sustainably and continue to exist as a company um, to your carbon footprint? Um, to fair wages, you know, how are you, there's, there's been a lot of talk um, likely instigated by the pandemic around how are we really treating workers and are we doing that in a sustainable, fair um, way, among other things. Those are just three points um, that I'm choosing to call out because they, they seem pretty relevant at the moment. Depending on what you do as a business, you know, different things are going to be more or less relevant. If you produce a product, looking at your cradle to cradle impact of that product is going to be a higher priority than if you perhaps then if you don't produce a product at all and you've got a totally remote team, et cetera, some of those um, metrics may be a little less important versus looking at, you know, for example, uh, the impact of your technology um, on what's going on with how you're having that impact on society. Um, my expertise, as you mentioned, is in purpose-driven organizations and the purpose-driven business model, which takes it even a step further um, to set a specific or focused purpose for their organization um, and then work to advance or move the needle in that specific area, usually alongside more general um, sustainability and being concerned about, you know, just because we're really interested in advancing women entrepreneurs, for example, doesn't mean we're not interested in our carbon footprint. 
but as a purpose-driven organization, we're also looking at key metrics uh, about whatever it is specifically that we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Yeah, that again helps us get a great baseline, I think. And I'm so glad that you brought up the economic importance of, you know, that businesses need to be financially viable as well in order to succeed. It's obviously on everyone's brain when they're starting a business. So um, it's definitely an important part of the puzzle. Um, switching gears slightly to, to Tita. So Tita, you, you mentioned a lot of different things in talking about your expertise in the social impact space. I know you've been working in this field in a while, for a long time. So I'm curious if you could name maybe a couple of trends that you've seen over your career in this space. You mentioned microloans and trade. What, what have you seen um, in your career in the space? Okay, very briefly, I guess everybody uh, should know that the whole subject matter of social entrepreneurship has gone through waves and uh, uh, the social responsibility is something that obviously uh, got a head start in the 60s, moving to the 70s and so on. And the social responsibility one, social responsibility two, social responsibility three, um, you know, for those of you that have studied that area and social responsibility, one is the idea that, you know, you cater, you know, to the folks that, you know, are impacted by the activities that you're involved in. And any corporation that feels that way, uh, then de develop a stakeholder map, you know, that move from employees to communities, you know, to the Too. And when you take action, and you may take the wrong action for the right reasons, so, uh, and then of course, the social responsibility three, when you start asking yourself the question, uh, who is the judge to determine whether you've done the right thing? And, uh, and social entrepreneurship has gone through these same phases, you know, and the first step, obviously, is recognizing a problem. And then being able to invert that problem into an opportunity so that you can actually, you know, define uh, a strategy for taking advantage of that opportunity, which obviously sounds like being able to have something to impact on that problem. Or as Katie was saying, you know, moving the needle. What I have observed uh, during this short period of being engaged in this is that um, for the most part, if we take the example of uh, micro lending, micro lending, which is the idea that with little amount of money, you can help poor folks lift themselves by their bootstrap, you know, with $50, $30 loans and so on and so forth. You know, there's some other things associated with it. But if you look all over, the world, you know, except maybe for Bangladesh. Uh, and you ask yourself, how many of these folks have been lifted from poverty, you know, because, you know, they got a $50 loan. And uh, research does indicate that the needle has moved very little on that. And there are many reasons for that. Uh, really poor folks giving money $50, $30 cannot cover their overhead, you know, to be able to move from poverty. And uh, then you have organizations, you know, that have done quite well with this. One of them is right there in our neighborhood, Acción. Uh, some of you should check out Acción. They, they did uh, go to Mexico. They invested uh, some money in starting a micro lending program. Then it got so successful that they went IPO and uh, they were able to harvest their investment for something like $300 million. And then, you know, and there's a question as to the people that they really went to help, how much of the poverty did they, you know, did they actually uh, resolve? So you got this problem of mission, mission drift. And some of you have heard about mission drift, 
you know, you go to solve one problem, you end up, you know, actually uh, drifting into other areas and you start justifying it and you start thinking that you're doing the right thing. And it's all of this, homelessness is a problem. Have we been able to do anything in that area? And um, so what has happened up to this point is the question as to whether or not uh, we've done the wrong thing for the right reason. And I can go on and uh, talk about this, but the first step obviously in social entrepreneurship is being able to define the problem and define the problem in such a way that it becomes an opportunity that you can do something about. And uh, in most cases, uh, folks end up uh, doing the wrong thing for the right reason. Some of you might have heard a little story and I'm gonna end there about this uh, uh, army person that was in uh, Somalia and then ran into this young boy that had not had any food, you know, for quite some time. Skinny, uh, dehydrated, and, you know, really, 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 really uh, just about, you know, dying. And what he did was to take his uh, packed lunch in his, in his backpack, uh, warm it up, which was a little steak and, uh, and some potato, and uh, fed this little boy. Uh, who was extremely happy, you know, to eat, you know, this food that was being given to him by this do-gooder. And he was trying to do the right thing. But then what happened? He sat there and watched that young man just go downhill. And uh, finally, you know, the young person did not survive. Uh, what happened? Well, he gave that young person food that could not be digested given his condition and that he was in. And those are many examples uh, that you do the wrong thing for the right reason. And the social entrepreneurs have to deal with this. So the first step, which is defining the problem and being able to appreciate uh, an opportunity, you know, to actually, uh, uh, you know, do something about it is the first step. I used to tell my students and all of you might have gone through Northeastern, uh, right on the, on, on the street there. There used to be a guy there who sat uh, begging for money and uh, he um, uh, had a little bag with him and so on. And if you gave him money, uh, he would take it. And then the next thing he did was of course, he ran around the corner and got a little uh, a bottle of, of liquor. And uh, that's what he was looking for. He wanted to take care of his own habits and so on. And a lot of people resented giving him money to go and, and consume alcohol. And uh, one time with my students, we did a little experiment, you know, and went into uh, the Burger King, got uh, a hamburger, brought it, and tried to give it to him. He refused to take it, and I left it beside him. And I went away. But when I came back, he had eaten that book. And uh, something happened there. Uh, did he need money so he could go and meet his needs, which was to buy liquor? Or did he need food, which was what he was sitting out there doing? And we debated this for quite some time. But the point I'm trying to make is uh, the first step in social entrepreneurship is the definition of the problem but the recognition that there might be an opportunity to move the needle, whatever that needle is. And most of us have found that that is a real challenge. And uh, for all of us, I think um, that's an area that requires a lot of thinking and uh, a lot of, uh, of, of, of engagement, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Tida. Well, and it's a great point. I, I think, you know, keeping in mind a problem and then realizing an opportunity can be challenging. But Ben, I think you and Boreo have done that quite well, actually, because it feels like you've built that really into the core of your, your business. So I'm wondering kind of more generally if you could speak to um, if you think businesses have a responsibility to consider social and environmental sustainability as part of their mission and why or why not. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I mean, to answer that question, and then I'm happy to dive more into our firsthand experience. I mean, honestly, I think we all have a responsibility. Um, the current situation we're facing um, in terms of environmental and, and social challenges the world's facing is, is it's a very unsustainable future we're, we're on track for. And um, before starting Boreo, I, I worked as an environmental consultant for over five years in, in a little bit in the States, in New Zealand, in Australia, and then in South America. And um, what I was experiencing, and maybe it was just simply being a, a young guy in my career and, and being a bit impatient, was um, not enough action. Uh, it was a lot of work, especially with government and um, large industry that um, was a lot of meetings to have a meeting, to write a report, to have a meeting and not enough change. And one thing I saw in, in that really connected with me in the, the, the space of um, industry of, of, of having a business is the agility a business has and, and how quickly they can change and, and take action to something. Um, but when you're a big business and when you have it, a, a, um, something very established of, of what your, how your business works, there are obviously limitations on how far you can take that in terms of addressing environmental social challenges. So looking at that, um, I really embrace the idea of an entrepreneur is really, their job is to find, find an opportunity in the market. And um, with so many problems we're facing in terms of environmental and social crises in the world, you could very quickly, instead of looking at them as problems, you can look at them as opportunities. And if you can connect those opportunities to meet this triple bottom line of, of also gaining a, a, an economic benefit to sustain a business, that's where you can find a sweet spot. And that's actually kind of what naturally happened with my career. Um, so I was working actually on a project uh, for the wild caught fishing industry of Chile and came across firsthand uh, this problem of discarded fishing nets. It's four times more harmful than all other forms of plastic pollution in the ocean combined. And I was firsthand with the fishermen asking, what are you guys doing about it? And they said, nothing. And these guys depend on this, this marine environment to, to sustain their, their well-being. Um, there was no other alternative than to use plastic nets because they're the strongest, they're the most cost effective, they're the lightest weight. Um, and so whether we liked it or not, they were going to continue to fish with them. And it really was just a matter of not having the opportunity um, to do something better when they meet their end of life. And it just so happened that plastic was highly recyclable, really consistent, and, and really good quality plastic that could be used for many other applications. And for us, it was just a matter of connecting the dots um, to find that, that bigger picture opportunity. And there's a lot that can be done in that way still today um, that, that we call as low hanging fruit, really tangible things um, that businesses can do. Obviously, as, as a startup, we had the benefit of building it from day one into the mission, into the crux of what we were doing. We really didn't see po a point in leaving our day jobs if it wasn't to have to some, something to do to serve these bigger purposes that we were so passionate about. Um, when it comes to bigger businesses, it, it's much more of a challenge because like I said, they, they have a lot more work that's already embedded in what they do and, and can be challenging to change. And that's where someone uh, like the work that Katie's doing is, is really powerful. Getting commitments from the top, um, getting the purpose in there, and seeing the bigger picture than instead of just the day-to-day, -day, which I even can be guilty of running into running Boreo, um, is so important into creating that into the business. And then from there, you can start to, instead of looking at everything in a cost perspective, instead of seeing things as, as an environmental and social opportunity, um, and, and you'd be surprised how much there can be to do. Um, there's so much evidence out there that shows when a business is, is having social environmental values, they get better talent to join their company, they retain the talent, and, and they also attract more clients. More and more businesses are demanding this. It's the reason we exist today and the reason we get to work with companies as big and influential as Patagonia is because we have embedded in us uh, such a strong social environmental mission uh, that we can really walk the talk with. Um, 
I'll stop there because <laughs> there's there's plenty other things that I think we can cover, but um, but happy to expand on that further if you'd like. Thank you. I think that that um, leads us into uh, talking a little bit more about definitions and maybe how existing corporations um, exist with their corporate social responsibility programs and how those differ from nonprofits versus social entrepreneurship as a whole. So Katie, I'm wondering if you could speak to kind of what the differences might be between those kind of three different uh, types of businesses and even the range of, of entrepreneurship. 100%. Um, so I will do my best to keep this relatively focused because we could we could talk about this for quite a while. But starting with the difference between a nonprofit and a social enterprise, because this is a question um, I actually get asked relatively often. In my mind, and other people may have a different opinion, um, they run in much the same way strategically in that they're setting out a purpose, vision, mission, values, and they're doing their best to you know, sustainably run their organization financially while making you know, specific impact. The inherent difference between a nonprofit and a for-profit really comes down to how they raise or make money. Um, you know, a nonprofit has to bring in donations, sponsorship, grants, other means of support, whereas a business sells something that has or should have inherent value as a way of bringing in capital. Now that's a, a gross simplification. There's obviously lots of unique ways to bring in capital, but fundamentally um, that's really where you see the difference. Personally, I tend to you know, encourage people to start with the social enterprise to see if the business model will work um, and then move into considering being a nonprofit second because you know, while, and, and I'll acknowledge every, everything everybody said on the phone, while, um, you know, there's some inherent challenges around social entrepreneurship, is it really working? You know, where are you in your definition of what that means? Um, there's something about the fact that you've got something to sell that has inherent value in the first place that provides sort of a more sustainable root capital versus nonprofits and, and all the ones I work with are in this position of basically having to constantly ask either people or corporations or grant makers for money all the time and it never ends that they're basically asking for money to go out and make this impact. And I think that that can be a really hard thing to do um, coupled with the fact that some of the expectations that we've put on nonprofits, namely that you know they're not supposed to spend anything um, to run their organization. Um, the reality is, and there's a lot of good research that's come out in the last couple of years um, that that expectation actually starves them um, and really lessens their ability to make impact. Um, so there's some challenges there. That all being said, um, I think nonprofits are certainly going to remain a critical part of the ecosystem. Um, and one of the areas in this conversation that I think um, has a lot of untapped potential is actually the partnerships between, you know, nonprofits and nonprofits, but certainly businesses and nonprofits, um, where they can use their different models and the different ways that they, you know, address need and make impact to actually work together and make more, um, which would be fantastic. Um, Corporate social responsibility is an interesting animal, um, at least in, in the work that I've been doing, if not by definition, um, by connotation, um, what CSR, you know, corporate social responsibility tends to indicate is a charitable program or a set of charitable activities that are separate from the core business activities. Um, and at least what I'm seeing in my work and in my research and, and constant reading is that um, this model is really dying out. Um, uh, as Ben mentioned, both consumers as well as your employees are looking for a much more integrated approach um, as far as how do we go about making impact. Um, and I actually had a great um, conversation with another um, impact strategist who's a delight where she said, you know, if we could just run our organizations better in the first place, there wouldn't be such a need to write these big checks to nonprofits to kind of pardon us of the ills that we did in the first place, um, which is a, a really interesting way to think about it. Um, so social entrepreneurship, certainly purpose-driven business, starting to provide that more integrated choice where you know that through your business model, hopefully, hopefully through your business model, you're directly making impact. Um, and that's how I, I sort of tend to look at the three of them. Thank you. And you, you heard it here, you know, people are more interested in having this baked into the business model. So for all of you, you know, budding entrepreneurs out there, um, start, start thinking about it now. It's never too early. 
So I'd like to switch gears slightly into kind of more action or tangible um, approach to how we might be able to implement some of the kind of high level discussion that we've been talking about today. So Tita, if I may start with you, and you've kind of tapped this a little bit and covered it a little already, but if somebody's really interested in getting into this space, but is kind of unsure where to start, um, where, where do you recommend, you know, to start? You mentioned a little bit about identifying a problem and trying to seek out opportunity. Could you expand a little bit more on that? Uh, and thank you, Gwen. Just to add a little bit to what Katie was saying, trying to differentiate between social entrepreneurship, not <clears throat> nonprofit and, uh, and, and, and some of the other aspects of, of public space. Um, I, I think a number of people have approach this in different ways. Uh, there's the nonprofit sector, as she has indicated. And there is the government sector. Uh, there is the business sector. As a matter of fact, some people would argue that social entrepreneurship is about trying to address uh, market failures that which cannot be resolved you know through the mechanism of of the market uh are the things that could be resolved you know through you know social entrepreneurship and uh, this takes on a, a very different you know perspective some uh, people like andrew walk uh who started a root uh, course uh, and i think it's a it's a it's a strong organization in the boston area and uh, Andrew worked for the uh, for the government, and uh, he views you know social entrepreneurship as the nexus you know between you know nonprofit, the government, and 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 business. But if you get uh, challenged you know by an issue that you consider you have to do something about or you are in a position where you want to solve a particular uh, problem, the starting point always is to be able to understand the problem. Uh, you know, who is impacted by the problem? Um, how does the problem, uh, what's the root cause of the problem? In other words, are you dealing with the symptoms of the problem or are you dealing with the root cause of the problem? Now, these are some very uh, difficult things you know, in to, to, to come to grips with. As an example, let me just tell you my own you know, difficulty. I got involved, again, at the level of the United Nations, but when I came to Northeastern, back, I came back to Northeastern after <clears throat> uh, escaping 9-11. Uh, I got involved in a program that we call HERA program. And this was a program dealing with girls, young ladies that had been trafficked. You know, they were victims of, uh, of, of sexual exploitation. And, uh, and it came from everywhere. And some of you may or may not know this, but Boston is a place where uh, young ladies, are, you know, cycle through you know, and sent to different places in the United States, you know, to be exploited, you know, sexually uh, exploited. And one of the things that we, you know, decided to do was to help, you know, uh, attack this problem of sexual exploitation, particularly when it came to young ladies, 18, 19, 20. And uh, so we started this program. And I thought the best way of doing it was to use entrepreneurship as a way of getting those young ladies involved uh, in, in resolving their own problems. Uh, and, uh, and so I started this program, got a little bit of funding from, the, uh, from the, the city of Boston, got a little bit of funding you know, from you know, the federal government. And I started with a cohort of about 30, you know, 30 uh, young, uh, young, young ladies. Now, coming to discover, we discovered right away that these young ladies were being maintained and put on the street by pimps. And uh, some of us almost lost our lives because we were, 
you know, taken away from uh, the, uh, the the bread and butter of, of these folks that actually, you know, had this control over these young ladies. But when we sat back again to think about the definition of the problem, there was a demand and supply thing. Are you actually, are you actually solving the problem by trying to deal with these young ladies? Or are you looking at the demand for these young ladies and trying to cut off that demand in order to deal with that problem? And, um, and for example, one of the young ladies, 18 years old, was bringing in a million dollars for her pimp. And she had three clients, uh, one in Florida, you know, one in the Boston area. She had three clients and they were contributing money so much so that her pimp was getting something like a million dollars a year. Now, beautiful young lady, and uh, how do you solve her problem by trying to get her to develop entrepreneurial uh, uh, orientation? Or do you solve it by attacking you know, the people that are, you know, paying this kind of money, you know, to take advantage of, of, of that. So the definition of, of the problem and the opportunity to solve that problem, uh, you know, is, 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 is I got involved with the, with the court system as a matter of fact, uh, my biggest uh, reward was we had a, judge uh, that because all of these young ladies would be caught you know you know locked up and uh, put on probation uh they came to my classes and uh, one of the judges right here in boston said if you go to jesus classes and you stay in this program for three months and you get a certificate i would wipe out you know expunge all of your uh, your, your problems and then you can be free to go back to your parents and so on and so forth a judge made that decision the prosecutors and the police did not like that one bit because they wanted to use the girl, you know, to catch the pimps and to catch the big guys rather than to solve her problem. And I say this because in all of our social enterprise, as in social entrepreneurship venture, we are really caught with trying to define the problem uh, from the perspective of the victims or the people that perpetuate the problem or from our own uh, idea of how to sustain that problem. Of course, when I left Northeastern, we never got more grants, so the program kind of withered away and so on. So getting money to sustain some of these uh, social uh, ventures is, is an issue. But anyway, the first step when is to define the problem. And as Katie has mentioned, to be, uh, uh, Ben has mentioned, to be able to recognize an opportunity for doing something about it. And that's where the challenge starts. And connecting mm -hmm. the dots, you know, to make it work uh, is another uh, difficulty in terms of being able to develop a business model that connects the dots. Because the business model that, you know, connect those dots. But the beginning is the definition of the problem. And uh, I think we should spend a lot more time you know, defining, you know, the problem and understanding whether we're dealing with the root cause of the problem or we are dealing with the symptoms of the problem. And so, anyway, I would end there. We can move further and uh, we can deal with uh, the interests of the folks that are participating. Thank you, Tita. Appreciate that. So let's say a business has defined the problem really well and sought out an opportunity. Ben, could you maybe um, name just a couple of steps that a, a brand new business might be able to take to kind of build this kind of social and just environmental sustainability into their offering? And maybe ex from your experience, what you, what you did. Yeah, I mean, I think what we did uh, is, is really, we tested out the idea quite thoroughly um, and it's, it, it really is not going to be effective until you can actually um, sustain and not only sustain scale. We ran into that problem with Boreo, um, where we just started out with a, a fairly novel idea of, of let's make a product out of recycled plastic pollution. And we landed on the skateboard. We saw it as a, as a 
as a fun and cool product um, and, and something that we could also transform plastic into something, a, a concept called upcycling, where you're creating much higher value. One kilo of plastic, we could now create over $100 out of it. Um, what we didn't realize was that um, th although we were working fine as a small business, is that uh, we were getting, uh, selling our, 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 you know, our skateboards every month to, to pay the bills. The opportunity was far greater um, with the fishing communities and the access of fishing nets. And we we're starting to realize we we're getting access to far more fishing nets that need a solution than we could make skateboards for. And so I think a really important thing when starting a social enterprise is seeing the opportunity to scale and setting those expectations from day one. Because the really powerful thing about social enterprises, you can use capitalism for good. So as, as typically a business grows and takes over an industry, you can have that social and environmental cause growing and taking over that problem it's addressing. And so what we eventually had to do to overcome our situation with Boreo is, is we actually did a fairly fairly um, significant pivot with the business that actually happened organically because that same time we were starting to realize that, that we we're getting a far greater traction with the fishing communities was actually the same time we had larger and larger brands coming to us and taking interest in our material and seeing if we could have the opportunity to incorporate into their their um, products uh, which takes on this much bigger cause on top of that uh, because virgin plastic most people don't realize comes from petrochemical plants and petrochemical plants are traditionally located next to low-income communities that are also um, being heavily affected by the, the air pollution from those plants. Um, there's, there's really terrible stories and cases of this happening in California, a lot happening in Texas, um, right here in the United States. And so now not only are we getting the solution for fishing nets, but we're also finding this solution by getting larger and larger brands committing to larger and larger volumes of plastic that once was virgin plastic every year now switching to 100 percent recycled plastic and so i i personally think it really depends on your expectations of a business but um of your social enterprise but i truly think a, a great social business is not only one that can sustain um, their, their cause uh, and also sustain their finances, but also be, have the ability to scale. And so I would definitely touch on that um, early on and test that idea out. Don't be afraid. People also, another benefit of being a social enterprise is people are generous because they, people in, inherently want to do good. So um, you'd be surprised how many doors will open for you when, when you have good intentions and, and being a social enterprise is, is a really good way of, of demonstrating demonstrating that. Thank you. All right, well, I wanna make sure we have a little bit of time for, for Q&A from the chat as well. So Katie, a question came in, how do you choose or design key performance indi indicators for a triple bottom line? Maybe you could also touch a little bit on kind of impact metrics, if you're familiar with that and what that means for businesses. So I'll talk about how we're doing it. I'll be the first to say that there's um, lots of really good stuff out there and different approaches that you can that you can take. Um, some being incredibly expensive um, as far as like how much impact are you making and having hundreds and hundreds of data points. Um, for me, that's that's I'd love to get there someday. But where we really focus with our clients um, is to say. Let's go back to that core strategy. You have a purpose, vision, mission, values, um, and we want to understand, you know, uh, for long-term goals, for example, what is the vision? You know, is, is it that, we'll use Ben as an example, is it that we, you know, remove all the plastic from the sea? I'm intentionally making that sweepingly broad. Um, you know, what is our long-term goal? What, what will the world look like if we're successful? Um, and then working a little bit back from there um, in that, aim. When you're really looking at a performance indicator, you know, the way that we like to do it is to come back to the mission statement and say, how are we um, go, you know, what exactly are we doing? Um, and when we form mission statements, we like to tell people to focus on the verbs. How exactly are you advancing towards your purpose? What are you doing? Um, and that can be a great way to say, what are those metrics? Um, and we like to look at, you um, areas first, you know, what are our areas of impact, and then breaking it down within those areas of impact. So we'll use a, um, 
a, a relatively tangible example, um, we were working with a foundation who had very specific programs. Um, and what they did was they broke their areas of impact along their programs because as a funding body, they needed to know how each program was performing. Um, and then they were able to, we were able to work with them to say, you know, what are the outcomes? Um, I think while nonprofits talk about outcomes, I still think sometimes there's a gap in social enterprises, like what outcome are we achieving and how effectively are we achieving it? And then working back from that, what actions am I taking to get to the outcome? And on, I don't have it handy, but I will make sure I share an article that broke this down in such plain language. I thought it was fantastic. Um, so I saved it. Um, and starting to work towards, towards what those are. So very much like you would, have, you would put these together for any business that you would want to look at, like, you know, we want to grow at 25% revenue per year. You know, how many prospects do we need to close? How many initial meetings do we need to have? It's really the same process, but you're, what you're looking to achieve may be different and how you're going about achieving it. You know, may, you know your, your sales percentages it likely is not the only thing that you need to be looking at um, as far as looking at more sort of general sustainability, your carbon footprint, et cetera, there are some great, I would say, take a look at some of the platforms that are out there that have, um, whether it's ESGs um, or SDGs, um, looking at how to try to align with those. I think that there's they're offering some really good frameworks um, that make that um, a little bit more accessible and give you a good starting point, but we tend to work with organizations really focused on their unique purpose and how do we um, put those things in place so that they can see financially we're bringing in enough money, we're making enough money, here's where the money is going, um, and here are the outcomes, you know, that we're getting out of that, and, you know, what do I need to know? Um, one of the one of the best questions somebody ever posed to me that we try to use in our work is, you know, what do I need to know to make a decision? You know, what do I need to know to decide that we're going to keep investing money in this, or we're going to keep selling this product or whatever, you know, what Ben determined was, I, I now have more material than I can make this product for. That's really important to know because it's going to change um, what it is that you're deciding to do. So tracking, you know, if I'm using a recycled uh, material, you know, is there is there more material than product or are they asking for more product than I can create material? It starts to give you um, some different information. I hope that was helpful. Um, we really take a, I really take a very specific route to each organization um, rather than a sweepingly general one. I know we're making a lot of sweepingly general kind of, you know, answering sweepingly general questions. So I know it's tough to, you know, cover everything in a short amount of time, we could talk about this for hours. Um, and if anybody, whoever asked that question, if you want to find me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to look at your particular group or what you might be struggling with. I'm happy to do it. Thanks for that offer. I think we have time for maybe just one more question. Um, so I'm going to open this up to all of our panelists here. I'm curious, how do you think businesses can balance social impact while ensuring that they're keeping costs in check? I know that's a common question of new businesses as well as ones that want to do something socially or environmentally sustainable and just aren't sure if they can balance the economic impact. Anyone's welcome to answer that. Um, I'll have a go. Uh, there's a lot of things that actually can be tied to um, being more cost effective when you have um, better environmental and social performance, especially at least on the, uh, I'll speak more on the environmental case for this example, but I mean, from us, um, we did, I highly recommend if you're making a product or, or delivering on a service to um, look into completing a life cycle assessment of your mm -hmm. product um, at the start to get a really thorough, raw understanding. It's, it's the most comprehensive method of understanding the environmental and social costs, really your environmental costs, the social impact categories aren't as, as developed, but um, it, it's really what, it's the techno the process they do to understand something's carbon footprint, water footprint, it, it understands all, all the, um, just as we know something in the economic cost, this allows you to understand the environmental costs of producing that product through its life cycle. Um, so we did that, and, and as an example, we found transport to be significant, and uh, also the, the recycling setup time for each batch um, to be costly. So by just simply saying from now on, 
every truck uh, transporting nets has to be at least 15 tons and every recycling run has to be at least 10 tons um, is now going to cause a, a, made a big efficiency measure in our movement that not only saved energy consumption in, in our carbon footprint, but also saved us on costs. I mean, that's a very basic example, but just to, to give you an idea. So the whole idea of, of environment, the main messages, and I, Katie being a consultant in this area, I think can expand on this, is that it, they don't always go opposite directions, environmental and economic and social and economic benefits. A lot of the time they can work together and it's, it's pretty eye-opening when you can start to look at it that way to see not only am I going to get a better image and a better value, retain better employees, but I'm also actually saving our bottom line um, by, by looking at things from an environmental and social point of view. Um, so I, maybe I'll pass it to Katie from there to, to expand on that from her experience as a consultant. I think you said it well, um, which is that, you know, choosing to be more social and responsible is not the enemy of profits. In fact, there's a great quote by one of my favorite, um, my current favorite thought leaders, uh, Alex, out of the London School of Business, that, you know, it's getting really good profits on some levels is the byproduct of having a really strong um having a strong purpose and operating in a more socially responsible way. Um, but that, you know, a couple of things to add to that. One, um, remember that it's an ongoing process. Um, a lot of the groups we work with sort of feel like we come in, we make the strategy, it's set and everything's just gonna work and we never have to look at it again. Wrong. Um, it's a constant assessment to see how you're doing. You go through a growth spurt, you change suppliers. Now what you were doing is no longer the same. You know, so there's a, there needs to be somewhat of a recognition that we're constantly looking at this and related to that, that it means that you have an opportunity to be, to be shifting over the long term, which is something I said earlier that, you know, while it may be, I'll pick a basic example, it may be expensive up front to change out all of our light fixtures to be more eco-friendly. In the long term, you're going to save a lot of money, you're going to reduce your impact on the planet, et cetera. So there is some, you know, starting to take that long-term view. Um, that starts to shift, you know, it, it may not help my ledger for this particular quarter, but it's going to help me over time and being able to um, share that story and explain that strategy often makes making those decisions um, a little bit more seamless. Um, and then the other thing that we, um, you know, tend to look at is at least the organizations we work with, because they have a really clear purpose and they understand what their mission is, they can start to make much more um, focused decisions. Um, and we're, you know, part of what we do is to try to help them avoid that mission drift that we were talking about earlier. It, it drives me nuts because it usually um, strains resources and people's time versus concentrating it in the right direction. Um, sometimes that can also help them to know what to say no to um, so that they're keeping their funds and their effort going towards the right things um, and also help them to innovate a little bit better because they understand why we're here and they're constantly asking how we can do it better. Um, so I think looking at it on some levels instead of, oh, I'm gonna to try to be responsible so it's gonna be this big cost, saying I have an opportunity to do things a different way, how do I start to make that an advantage um, to, to my organization? All right, well, I think that's our time today. I thank all of the panelists for being here and, and all of the attendees as well. I hope you found this a valuable conversation. And I do believe I'm definitely volunteering myself on LinkedIn as well to connect with anyone if you're interested in the subject matter. Um, and I'll hand it over to Katie to close us out. Thank you so much, Gwen. And thank you again to all of our panelists for joining us today. Thank you to our mentors and ventures and, and other community members on the call. It was great to have you join us. Please be on the lookout for future founder panel series sessions. We'd love to have you uh, join additional panels on, on different topics. We try and host these about every eight weeks through the Venture Mentoring Network. If you have any questions about what we do through the Venture Mentoring Network or what Gwen does um, with IDEA, Northeastern's Venture Accelerator, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. As she said, you can find us on LinkedIn and or email us right at Northeastern. Um, we are on a variety of different websites. You can find us. Our email in particular is, is pretty simple. It's just vmm at northeastern.edu. 
feel free to reach out at any time. And again, we hope to see you virtually, at least for the time being in the future. Thank you, Gwen, Ben, Katie, Tita for joining us today, virtual claps for our panelists.